Hello, I'm Dr. Russell Libby, and I welcome you to the world of medicine. You know, living here in Northern Virginia, we're right smack dab in the allergy belt. And most of us, or at least people we know, will have seasonal allergies. You know, itchy nose, sneezy, incredibly itchy eyes in the pollen seasons, possibly all winter long being miserable with, oh, you know, the dust, dust mites, those kinds of things. Some people get more than the runny nose. They may get asthma symptoms. They may have problems that are fairly significant, but we all know what to do with most of it. But there is a certain category of allergy that we don't quite hear as much and understand as well. It's food allergies, and food allergies happen a lot. I mean, much more than people might recognize. And in fact, it seems that the frequency is increasing. Now, we're gonna learn tonight about food allergies. It's a really dangerous and scary experience if you have a child with food allergies, or if you're an adult that has to be aware of all the things that you need to understand about what happens, how to avoid them, and how to treat them if, in fact, you do end up with some kind of episode. We've got a great audience who's gonna share their stories. Uh, many of them are patients who have grown up with allergies. Some are parents who have young children with significant allergies, but you're gonna hear how they appear and what they've had to do to live with them. We have also an expert, uh, one of our foremost allergists in the area, Dr. Martha White. She's with the Institute for Asthma and Allergy. They have offices in Silver Spring, where she works near Wheaton, as well as in Chevy Chase. Great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Um, when we talk about allergy in general, uh, there are lots of conceptions and misconceptions, but give us a little basic primer on what allergies are. Well, allergy is an inherited condition. We're not actually born with allergies, but we're born with the ability to develop an allergy. And in order to have that happen, you have to be exposed. So for a person genetically able to develop an allergy to say milk, once you get exposed to a certain amount of milk at a certain age, you develop this little molecule called IgE. It's a little Y-shaped molecule that then recognizes milk. And then when you get exposed to it again, it, release, it causes a mast cell in the body to release histamine and other goodies that then causes allergic reactions. You can also have allergic reactions to cats, ragweed. Most of us have some sort of allergy to something in, in the environment. Um, but food allergies can be particularly scary. Uh, you can have respiratory problems, you can have a rash, um, abdominal problems. Sometimes people will even get a stuffy nose from a food allergy, but it can be life-threatening. So, and, and just to explore that IgE um, issue, so you have certain cells that line the respiratory tract, they're inside your eyes and your conjunctiva and in your nose mm -hmm. and those areas. And, and of course, the simple one being the pollen, they recognize that pollen and it causes those cells to release irritating things that make those symptoms. Basically, yes. They're called mast cells and they're everywhere, but mostly in our skin and then mucous membranes. So the gut, the nose, the lungs, the eyes, as you mentioned. Right. And, and the histamine, I guess, the chemicals. Histamine is one of, of the major chemicals that gets released during an allergic reaction. There are other chemicals as well, but we're all familiar with the word antihistamine. Right. Um, antihistamines block the effect of histamine. Right. So, therefore, that's why they have all those allergy medicines on the counter that certainly we all tend to think whenever we have a runny nose, maybe it's allergy, and we take one of those, it's going to make it all better, and sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. But just Starting with, with you, when did you, did you ever know that you would be an allergic person? How could you ever know that, right? I never knew that I would ever be allergic to peanut until my mom gave me peanut butter on a celery stick. I think I was three. Three. Yeah, and I got an allergic reaction to it. I stopped breathing and I got hives. Wow. Well, I guess you didn't even know to get scared at that point. Mm. But I bet you did. Very scared. Yeah. Very scared. Didn't know what was going on. First child, you know, like everybody else, you try new food and peanut butter was, it was actually at the age of one to introduce peanut butter. Right. And uh, she had a, you know, blisters on the lips and then broke out in hives and stopped breathing and wow. scary, scary experience. So did, did you have any inclination to think that you could have <laughs> allergies in the family? Do you have allergies yourself? I don't have allergies. Uh, Mom? Uh, her side does. Her side does. Okay. She says my side, I say her side. Right, okay. <laughs> we, we take both parts. Somebody's getting blamed for this, exactly. right. And 
You have children with allergies. Yes, my youngest. Uh, Any thought that you could ever have a kid with allergies? I mean, did you have allergic problems in the family? No, um, no idea. I've never been diagnosed with any allergies. Or, you know, certainly experienced some stuffiness around the, the allergy seasons, but not anything I even had to take medicine, right. over-the-counter medicine okay. for. And your children are how old? Uh, my daughter is five. She's the youngest, and my son is six, almost seven. Okay, and. and he, who was the first? He was the first one. He's the first, and he has environmental allergies right. that we didn't find out until after she had her food allergy diagnosis. We had him tested, but then she, after she was born, um, she was diagnosed at, at three months with 40% of her body covered in eczema. So that was how you started to discover something was going awry. Right. Yeah. Yep. And how about you? You're, how old were you when you started to have allergies? You know? I was like, I think one or younger. One or younger. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's, do you remember that? No. No, it's hard <laughs> to remember that. Even though you look like you'd, you'd know pretty much everything that's going on out there. How did, uh, how did that come about for you? She threw up quite a bit when she was a uh, baby. Mm -hmm. And um, I finally went into the doctor's office one day and said I shouldn't have to change her clothes five times a day. <laughs> There's something wrong with her. And they just decided to do a basic blood test. And then we were very surprised to find out she tested allergic to fish, soy, egg, milk, and nuts and tree nuts. And that was it? That was at 14 months. At 14 months. Mm -hmm. And did you have much of a family history for allergy? Uh, none, except that she does have a cousin who is a couple years older who, again, just out of the blue, also has food allergies. But we were not, it really wasn't on our radar right. screen. At all. Yeah. Right. Okay. Very good. Interesting. <coughs> and you have some children with allergies. I do. I have two kids, my seven-year-old son as well as my three-year-old daughter. Um, my son is allergic to peanuts and um, eggs, and my daughter is allergic to shellfish as well as eggs. Right. And what age, let's say for your son, did you come to realize that he had allergies? I think he was about 12 months old, so just about a year old, when his father first gave him peanut butter. And um, I came home to find him with a swollen face and um, definitely rushing him to the hospital at that point. With my daughter, I think she was about um, 18 months when she had her first taste of um, shrimp. And she got a body rash, and then um, their first allergy testing was not until um, last year, and that's when I discovered that my son had egg allergies as well. Wow! And you have allergies. I do. Yeah. When did they come about? Well, I thought it was as an adult, but once you find out as an adult, you realize you've been having them your whole life and didn't know that every time you ate shrimp and had to go to the bathroom, that that wasn't normal. Everybody uh -huh. doesn't do that. Uh -huh. So you so, start working okay. in an allergy office and you find out you're allergic. <laughs> and um, I'm allergic to horseradish, which is fairly rare. Right. And I actually anaphylax and have to have the EpiPen. And, Blood pressure drops and so horseradish it's really not good. Is the only thing horseradish and shellfish, and, oh, which is so a, which go hand in hand. Right. By the way, I mean, how could you tell which it was? <laughs> I don't know. I just suddenly started thinking. This is why I don't like right. cocktail sauce. Yeah, I guess. Now I figured it out. For, let's skip the hors d'oeuvres, huh? Yeah. Oh, right, it's just I can really imagine. bad, but it's yep. not, I don't have it in my family that I right. know of. Okay. So it never occurred to me, right. and then I have these severe reactions and. Dr. White said, why well, you're allergic. Yeah, <laughs> I would imagine, yeah. I'll be darned. I'll be darned. Isn't that interesting? And you have some yourself. Yes, I was actually in denial for five years. <laughs> oh, really? Well, yeah, I like, couldn't understand why I would have these reactions and violently throw up. I just decided, I'm not going to these restaurants anymore. They must have bad food. Right. <laughs> then I cooked it at home, crab, uh -huh. and realized um, it just got worse and worse over the years, and I had to finally get a connection. And <coughs> and lo and behold, I was allergic to crab. Interesting. And you? I only have one shoe on. You only have one shoe on? Well, are you allergic to your other shoe? Yeah. Yeah? I'm going to try not to make noise by putting it back on. Ah, I see. Well, that's okay. Um, you have allergies. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. You don't think so? Don't no. Have any. What is it that ah. we look for on the box before we eat it? Uh, a light? Okay, he is quite the comedian. I need a shoe. 
Huh? Um, okay. He had a list of about 12 things he could not eat as yeah. a baby, and it was started off as milk, soy, egg, you know, the nut, peanut, peas, beans. You ever heard a little baby you can't eat strained peas? I mean, none of that. Um, you know, sesame seeds, and um, so we're down to nuts and peanuts. Right. So we're really very excited. <laughs> he doesn't really like talking about having food allergies, which I find a lot of kids don't really like to talk about having food allergies. So I think that's why he's um, pulling the comedian uh, act here. I guess he don't understand because I'm allergic to shoes. Oh, you're allergic? <laughs> well, of course, and that's why you're trying to get rid of one, right? Okay, we understand that. So we're getting a pretty good perspective. We're getting a pretty good perspective of, of what kinds of things people go through. Now, you've got a pretty interesting history and I can't imagine you f remember the first time you had an allergic reaction. Um, no, actually, I don't remember the first time I had a reaction. As my mother had told me, it was in the womb, which is a shock to me. <laughs> I had no idea. Um, I have milk, egg, nuts, tree nuts, um, fish, shellfish, and bee sting allergies, which are actually anaphylactic. And um, I would go into anaphylactic shock within about seven minutes. I would have to administer my own EpiPen, um, call 911, ask for immediate um, help. It and they didn't even have cell phones back then. <laughs> no. It would have been much easier. Uh, that would have been great. Well, we'll have to hear more of the details. So did you have much of a family history for allergy? We had some uh, minor allergies. My sister was allergic to milk, mm -hmm. um, but it was belly aches. Uh, rash, things of that nature. He was as severe as I thought it could get. <laughs> uh, and I, we're, we'll come back and talk a little bit because I know you had some really exceptional experiences. And we got a, a series of three here. I know that, how old were you when you started with your allergies? I was between a year old and 18 months. I took a uh, rich cracker from another kid at a play group and um, I'm very... You paid the price, didn't you? Yeah, you yeah. bet. <laughs> I learned my lesson about stealing food from other people. That's right. <laughs> and I'm sure your parents reinforced that multiple times since then. Uh, I'm trying to get a little lax on that. <laughs> okay. Do you have any other types of allergies? I'm allergic to nuts and peanuts and minor allergies in shellfish, sesame, poppy, and lentils. Any seasonal type things? Not really. No. And you, you've got a family with some three kids. three kids. Oldest daughter, nine, also from a Ritz cracker. Is that right? butter cracker, ah. yeah. She was um, just under two and took a little bite of a cracker from her friend, also not her own food, right. and um, pretty immediately gave it back to me, like, you know, making a face like, Mom, I don't like this. And I turned around to throw it away in the trash can. And by the time I turned back to face her, her lips were huge. And her whole face just started puffing up, redness all down her neck, um, rushed her to the hospital, and by the time we got there, she was throwing up. Her eyes were completely swelled shut, and she was wheezing. Mm -hmm. Probably scariest moment in my life. Wow. And Family history for much allergy? Seasonal and pet allergies, yeah. that kind of thing, but nothing, nothing like this. Like this. No, no. Right. And you, you're... You've had quite a, a gloriful history as well. Yes, I have. Um, as my parents tell me, at about three months, they, uh, I was covered in eczema, so they took me to the doctor and they discovered that I was allergic to the milk in my formula. And then at two years old, my sister fed me a peanut butter cup and I anaphylaxed for the first time and they had to take me to the hospital and after that, I had an extensive work up and they discovered that at that time I was allergic to milk, egg, pistachio, cashew, peanuts, soy, uh, shellfish, and fish. But thankfully now I've grown out of my milk and egg allergies and soy as well. So basically that's why you're so thin because you couldn't eat anything, right? <laughs> but I also noticed that you didn't name the brand. So we all know those peanut butter cups uh, and those peanut butter crackers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they seem to be the ones that get them. So you all experienced this firsthand, and now I've got both parents here. So who was the one who was responsible for that first exposure? His sister. His sister. Okay. <laughs> yeah. She's okay. not here to defend She's herself. All right. That's the best way to do it. Absolutely. 
So we're hearing some consistency in the stories. Uh, surprisingly, not as much family history for allergy as, as we typically see. When we look at, uh, at allergy and that hereditary factor, are there any statistics that we can look at? Well, actually, <coughs> allergies do tend to run in families, but you can have a parent with asthma, a kid with uh, food allergies, somebody else in the family with nasal allergies, allergic rhinitis. So I think if we delve a little bit deeper, we'll find that most people here have a family history of at least seasonal allergies, but food allergy per se doesn't necessarily run in families. Right. We do see it, but it doesn't always. And when we talk about uh, statistics, I, I guess some people will sort of look in this area, and mm -hmm. what's, what's the percentage of people with just general seasonal type allergies or environmental well, allergies? Right, so countrywide it's about 20% of people have allergies in the mm -hmm. D.C. area since we're in a river basin and there's a lot of mold. Um, the incidence is a little higher. It's probably more like 25, pushing 30. Okay. So, and if you have both parents, you have probably a much If you've like, got both parents, you're doomed. Group. Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, so, and, and the food allergy part of it, of course, people think that they, they can specifically inherit certain allergies, but you're saying it's just the tendency to be allergic. It's the tendency to be allergic, although we do see families where the parents have food allergies, the kids have food allergies, multiple children in the family have food allergies. So we, we certainly see that. So but that a, doesn't mean that, that you can't be the only person in the family with a food allergy. Right. And as we heard, uh, someone who lived quite a bit of their life just wondering why every time they ate a specific food, they had some kind of reaction, which we'll talk about the types of manifestations that people have with foods. I want to hear just a, another issue. And, and the frequency of, of allergy, and in, in particular food allergy, seems to be increasing. There is true statistical background to that. Absolutely. If you look at the data over about the last 15 years, it's doubled. And you get that same data whether you look at sort of the incidence of food allergy reported or if you look at emergency room visits. Um, so we're not exactly sure why <laughs> we're seeing so much food allergy. Um, but the thought is that it probably is truly more food allergy and not just that we're recognizing it more. Right. And when we're talking about food allergy, we're talking about what percentage of the pediatric population, kids under 10, let's say. Is there a statistic that's <coughs> close? I'm sure there is, and, and whatever I quote is probably not going to be correct. However, the uh, chairman of the board for the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Network is in the room, and I'll bet you can give us that statistic. Or well, am I putting over, you on we'll the spot? Yeah, sure. Put me on the spot, but the, the number that's been quoted recently is up to about 4% of Americans have food allergies, 11 million people. Right. And as the doctor says, we're not surely, maybe you can speak more about it, but we don't really know why. Is it we're too clean? Right. We're overly immunized? Right. And we just know it's going on the rise. And then that's why groups like the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Network was created, because you've got parents around here we all say, gee, my kid has it, my kid has it. So we've become the central place for people to go with a website, foodallergy.org. We have recipes on there. There's a kids uh, program. Sam here is involved in the teen program. So what parents need is education awareness because we don't have treatments yet and we don't really have any cures. So, and we're going to hear more about that too. So 4% would then be the general population. So yeah. that would be the adult population. And from what I understand, it's, it's probably about double that when you're kids, and we've heard of a lot of, of, of these stories here with people losing allergies over time, although not all allergies. So. Right. Kids outgrow most of their allergies, but we're less likely to outgrow nut allergies and shellfish. Okay. So those are the worst. And, and, and in, some of us poor adults are still allergic to things like milk, uh, like me. <laughs> When we talk about these hypotheses, I think it's really interesting as to how that has come about. They have something called the hygiene hypothesis, which you were sort of alluding to, which is about us living in this clean society where we don't get exposed. What's the basis for, for that kind of Well, put very theory? simplistically, um, the body's immune system works to fight infection, but it's also responsible for allergic reactions. And there's this is very simplistic. Um, it's a 
terribly complicated system, but essentially there's an arm of the immune system that fights infections. There's another arm that allows us to become allergic. And the idea is that if we don't have very many infections and we don't keep the infection side of the immune system busy and developing when we're young, it's free to start developing allergy. And there's actually some fairly decent data um, that would suggest that people who have a lot of infections early on or live on a farm and get a lot of exposure to animals or have five cats in the house when they're little are less likely to have asthma. Whether that translates to less likely to have food allergies, I'm not so sure the data are there, but we can certainly stop um, beating ourselves up over letting the kids play on the floor or play in the dirt. You know, right. God meant us to do that. and. We can let our kids do it. <laughs> it's, it might it's, help. it's good it for might, you. Yes. Yeah. So, so instead of running and cleaning their hands off right away, uh, let them lick the floor a couple of times. They'll pick up <laughs> That's some. That's right. The five-second rule. <laughs> stimulate that immune system. It won't bother becoming immune to things it shouldn't become immune to. And, but still, the genetics are a big part of it. Right. Um, when your daughter had her reaction, you said her lips blistered up. Is that right? Yeah, lips blistered up, <clears throat> and then we went to. So it probably be the worst thing. We to give her a bath, and that started the, the hives, just hives from head to toe. We just freaked out, and so you had no idea what we happened. We had no idea what was going on. Right. Just, you know, we thought nobody in our out. You know, fa both sides of our families didn't have any food allergies right. until you started asking. Right. And um, you know, we we called nine. We ended up calling nine one one. They came right away. Gave her an epinephrine shot, and uh, from from there, it was a new, <laughs> it was a new life. It was a, it was a new life. Yes, and. Um, at that point, you had to really educate yourself and go through the process of understanding what you were dealing with. That's correct. So we've heard of one description, I guess. That's a pretty radical description when your lips blister. <clears throat> Boy, that would, be, that would be tough. And I don't even want to ask what happens on that first date. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> um, your son's symptoms, you started at, at what seemed to be an earlier time. Mm -hmm. um, he said that you, you knew he was allergic mm -hmm. in utero. I did. Yes. Well, tell us what, what t tipped you off that way. Um, I had had several <coughs> different incidences of like belly aches and things of that nature. Uh, my sister was allergic to milk. And I drank a milkshake one day and wound up in the ER with pains to the extreme <coughs> of they thought I was miscarrying. And the ER doctor said, do you have any milk allergies? And I said, no. She said, I think your baby does. <laughs> because he was under distress, she said, when they ultrasound. I was uh, seven or eight months pregnant right. at that point. But the, then the day he was born, he had his actually first reaction. He had little hives on his cheeks and had trouble breathing and his little lips turned purple. Um, they had given him formula. In the nursery. In the nursery. <clears throat> so you weren't even there then, you just got the story. Well, no, they brought him to me because he was uh -huh. supposed to be breastfed. Okay. And they brought him to me and we found out that one of the nurses had supplemented because I had a C-section. Mm -hmm. So she had supplemented with a formula bottle and he reacted. We didn't know until they put him in the uh, neonatal, right. and I wasn't even allowed in there. Right. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, and they confirmed it later that night. But still, he went home, and he, he was home. breastfeeding, and then did he get some formula at some point? I mean, did you have some evidence <clears throat> that he was having a hard time with, with the milk? Um, he spit up constantly. Um, I didn't know, and of course information wasn't there for me. I just didn't know that things I ate, of course, was going to him. Uh, I didn't know he was allergic to the mass of things he was. And he was spitting up and he was rashed. It seemed everywhere. And I kept going to the pediatrician and... They kept putting him on Zantac and saying he had reflux and... Well, we didn't have any of no. that yet. Okay. Um, they, they knew he had allergies. We just didn't understand the extremity of them. Okay. Um, then we got real familiar with an EpiPen I, within the first month right. wow. of him. And that's, that's pretty exceptional to start that young. Is there, 
let's say, is there any likelihood that, that people would know in utero that a, a baby could have allergies? He is actually the first person I've ever heard that um, has reacted in utero, but what we eat can cross right. you know, the, um, Placent the placental barrier. Mm -hmm. So, you, I mean, there are children who will react to a food the first time that they're fed, and the thought is that it was exposure in utero that did it. So. And we've heard a little bit about um, kids in that first year of life demonstrating milk sensitivities and having to be on special formulas or at least stay breastfed, have right. some kind of elimination diet. When we're talking about that kind of sensitivity, is that the same as the ordinary allergies that we see with the IgE type processes? Well, a food allergy actually is an IgE-mediated allergy. But there are other food problems that manifest during the first year of life um, that are not necessarily allergic. Right. They're, they're more of a food intolerance. And you, you get vomiting, um, maybe some bloody diarrhea. It goes away with elimination of the food, and they eventually outgrow it. But an actual allergy can be life-threatening. It's a much more serious. But you can, um, you can diagnose that with a blood test or a skin test. So in the IgE-mediated allergy, the true allergy, you can get a positive test. For the other one, um, the skin testing is going to be negative, but the symptoms are there and they'll outgrow it. So it, that's, I, I think, is an important point because a lot of people think when a child has that kind of milk intolerance, a protein mm -hmm. intolerance from whatever it might be, that that is equal to being allergic to milk. But in fact, it's a little different. And the let's say the perseverance of that kind of symptom isn't going to be too long or it's going to be at least limited. That doesn't mean they don't have food allergies later on anyway. Right. They're still in that percentage. So uh, that, that's a very important point. And there are other kinds of um, confusing symptoms that people think are food allergies, uh, lactose intolerance, things like that. Right. Well, lactose intolerance is an inability to digest milk. And so people with lactose intolerance, when they eat milk or ice cream, um, cheese, will get a bloated stomach, there's a lot of pain, and you can get those same symptoms with an actual allergy, but the difference is that with a lactose intolerance, um, they might be able to tolerate a tiny amount of it. Um, the skin test and the blood test will be negative. And you can actually eat the enzyme at the same time as the food and be able to tolerate the food. Not so with, with a food allergy. That needs to be taken very seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, lactose intolerance might make you wish you were dead, but a food allergy will make <laughs> you dead. <laughs> Big difference. I would say. Yeah, I'd take the former any time. Um, when we also talk about some of the other things, there's some, some let's say, uh, biological substances, chemicals, chocolate for some people, red wines for some that precipitate migraines or other kinds of physical symptoms. Are those considered allergies themselves? No, those are intolerances. Um, you can get a lot of side effects from foods, just like you can get side effects from drugs. They're not specifically allergy. So allergy is a very specific immune response to, to a food. Um, and let me just give you an example of what I'm thinking of there. If I blow pepper in your face, mm -hmm. you're probably going to sneeze. That is an intolerance to pepper being blown in your face. You're not allergic to it. Right. It's just you don't tolerate it. Um, some people are less tolerant of foods than others and will react with, uh, with less exposure. And then we, we also heard uh, about our horseradish and crab intolerance, which was always figured to be <laughs> that restaurant just didn't have <clears throat> a very clean kitchen. And although nobody else got sick, but I guess that would be what we'd be looking for if uh, we were thinking that maybe it was some kind of food poisoning. Well, that's right. And when your major symptom is from the stomach, is GI, it becomes a little bit more complicated because most of the food intolerances will manifest as stomach aches or maybe a headache. Um, as soon as you see the hives, the swelling, it becomes much more obvious. And so people who just have abdominal complaints oftentimes will go a really long time before it gets diagnosed if it's an allergy. Interesting. So we've got symptoms that you've described. You've had hives. You've um, had airway problems. Yeah, my airway would close off. Um, my face would swell, I would get hives, um, I would turn all sorts of different colors. Uh, um, it, it was pretty ridiculous. Pretty um, dramatic. Yeah. yeah. So we've heard 
Gastrointestinal symptoms, we've heard um, actually, uh, according to what the history is, that he actually went into shock at some point. When we're talking about these kinds of reactions, what are the types of things that we generally categorize as food-related symptoms? For oh, it can be anything. So the most dangerous would be shock, which means that your blood pressure drops enough that you can't stay conscious. Um, and that's life-threatening. The other um, reaction that's life-threatening would be airway problems. So you can get sweat. The same swelling that you see in the lips or the skin can happen internally. If that happens around the throat, um, it closes off the airway. You can't breathe. You can have a very bad asthma attack, again, from swelling within um, the airways. Uh, we see skin. So you can get swelling, you can get hives. Um, eczema very commonly is caused uh, by food allergies. Um, and then the GI manifestation. Some people will even get diarrhea. They may have to run to the bathroom. I've even seen people with uterine contractions. You know, wow. feel basically, like what happens when you're trying to have a baby. Yeah, which may have been what happened to mom here. Um, right. So when you've had your reactions, now, have you had any conscious reactions where you've ever had to respond and, and take uh, epinephrine or? When I was about 11, yes. um, I, it was on my dad's birthday and I had pistachios. Um, my mom did not remember or when I was tested after my first reaction at two <coughs> that uh, I was allergic. It did not show that and so the first thing I remember is I got really thirsty and I, I was drinking everything I could and then I went to the bathroom and I started vomiting and I could feel my, uh, my throat swelling up and pretty quickly after that my mom recognized that I was anaphylaxing and so uh, we got in the car and started driving to the ER and she was on the phone with my pediatrician asking if they thought we should do the uh, administer the EpiPen right then, but um, they said no, as long as you get to the ER right away, then uh, you, I didn't have to do that. And so we, we just got to the ER and they gave me Benadryl and whatever other magic solution they had, and after a night I was doing a lot better. So you were lucky. Yes, I was. Yeah. And um, you mentioned the word anaphylaxis. You're, you have one who's had an episode. Yeah, her very first her was very full first. blown anaphylaxis. Uh, yep. Yeah, and I think for parents too, um, your reaction and how you treat the allergy sometimes is governed by if you've actually seen anaphylaxis or not because it's easier to be in a little bit of a denial and to say, oh, well, we just have a mild food allergy. And um, I like to say there's no such thing as a mild food allergy yeah. because your past reactions don't predict your future reactions. So, you know, for the past 10 years, you may have only had mild reactions. It doesn't mean you don't have the potential to have a very severe reaction, which is why it is so important to always carry your epinephrine auto injector because yeah. Benadryl won't save your life. Right epinephrine will save your life. And your interest in this has evolved. Um, you've gotten very much involved. Uh, I have. Yeah. You know, I, um, I was a practicing attorney. That was my first professional life. And I have a second professional life. I work at FAN um, doing all sorts of education programs in schools. And I started by doing a program for teachers. And it's called Everything an educator should know about food allergies. Yeah. Very basic because that interaction when a parent comes to a teacher to say, here's an epinephrine auto injector, you know, here's my five year old, you may have to save her life. It's such an uncomfortable um, yeah. dialogue on both sides. You know, the parent is terrified that you're leaving your child in the hands of someone who doesn't know what to do. And the teacher may be terrified if they don't know anything about food allergies. Oh my gosh, this is a big responsibility. And um, it's not you know, rocket science, it's, it's doable. It's infinitely doable to keep kids safe at school. You just gotta know the basics. Right, and we'll, we'll explore that a little bit in a few minutes as well. So anaphylaxis, um, we've heard that there are symptoms you get with certain food allergic experiences, but what qualifies it as anaphylaxis? Well, anaphylaxis is a body-wide or systemic reaction. Um, and it's usually manifest by most people have skin, um, flushing, hives, 
Um, but they also would have either airway problems, uh, GI problems, or, um, or blood pressure. And the scary things would be loss of blood pressure or shock or airway closure. Um, and those are immediately life-threatening. And as was mentioned, you never know how quickly or how far a reaction is going to go. And so I always tell my patients that if they notice anything at all, that they use that EpiPen because you don't want to wait until you feel like you or your child is going to die before you pull out that EpiPen and actually use it because the difference between the person who survives a bad allergic reaction or an anaphylactic reaction is how fast they got that first shot of adrenaline, which is what's in your epinephrine auto injector. Okay, so anaphylaxis sounds like a pretty unpleasant experience. Very. And pretty <laughs> and scary. scary for any of those who might be observing it. And of course, uh, as we were hearing, uh, even uh, those who are responsible for being able to see if that happens, uh, that's a pretty big responsibility. Uh, are there, let's say, in the worst of situations, people can die from anaphylaxis? Oh, absolutely. Uh, do you have an estimate as to how many people will die in the country? I, I'm just curious if, if there's sort of a statistic mm -hmm. just understanding that it is it a very common occurrence locally? It, um, no, and actually I should have looked that number up for you. It should be zero. It should be it zero. It is not. It's a totally preventable um, problem. Because it's a totally preventable problem once the diagnosis is made. There's always that first reaction and nobody's expected to have yeah an epinephrine auto injector or know how to take care of themselves with that first reaction. And the first reaction can be lethal, but, but once the diagnosis is made, avoidance and administration of adrenaline is life-threatening. And it's a real shame when somebody succumbs to an allergic reaction to a food once they've been given that EpiPen. So we're hearing a lot of people sort of assume that certain foods may be allergenic for their child and at certain times we've heard also that it may not be true allergy but some other kind of process but when we really do want to evaluate these children at what age can we start to do some real defined allergy testing you can actually start allergy testing in the first few months of life if you need to um, and I think it's important to try to figure out a diagnosis, but it's also important for people to understand that there's two different types of allergy testing. There's a skin test that we do, um, and then there's also a blood test. And sometimes, especially in little people, I get a different answer from the skin test than I do from the blood test. So normally I like to look at both um, so that we can be sure that we don't miss anything. The other thing to remember is that sometimes um, we'll get a very low positive on the blood test for a food that somebody's able to eat and they tolerate well. And the bottom line is if you can eat a food and absolutely nothing happens, then you're not allergic to it. Um, you digest a food, so what goes in the mouth doesn't necessarily correspond to what gets absorbed um, from the gut and into the bloodstream. And what we test with is what would originally go into the mouth. Okay, so and that's important to know because I think that people might get very frightened and they'll see symptoms and they'll eliminate very important and nutritious foods from their child's diet. So they, they really do need to know, number one, what it is that, that they need to eliminate mm -hmm. for the safety of the child and their, their general state of health, but also to make sure that they know what they need to feed that baby for nutritional purposes. If you eliminate soy and milk, uh, you've eliminated what most people use for protein. Exactly. And as they're growing up, that's going to be an important issue. So allergy testing can start in that first year. Uh, people often say, well, you better wait until they're two because it's not very accurate. It's hard to tell. And I guess if you have very severe eczema, the skin tests are a little bit harder to perform. Well, with eczema, you have to try to find skin that's not involved. Right. So that's <laughs> absolutely. Um, but. Happily, the, the back is usually not involved. Eczema is one of those conditions that requires scratching or some sort of rubbing in order for the skin to break out. And so most of us can't reach the middle of our backs very well, and so that's usually a pretty good, clear place. Um, but there is always the blood test. The other thing that I, that I didn't mention is that kids tend to be really smart. And so a parent might bring a four-year-old in and say, I think he's allergic to peanut, he's had this problem, and you know, he's had this problem with egg. And I'll always say, is there something that your child will not eat that everybody else loves? 
And I am always very suspicious of the kid who won't eat ice cream or doesn't want peanut butter when everybody else wants it because they oftentimes won't eat it because they're allergic. And nobody's figured it out because they just they never eat it so they, so they don't have reactions. Um, and it's those parents who don't push you know, that, that don't figure it out. But when you skin test them, a lot of times they end up with actually being allergic and there's a reason that the child didn't want to eat those popular foods. So people might actually, as we were hearing about the crab, but it could be any fruit it could be um, any other substance that they get some gastrointestinal distress from, have diarrhea or something, like within 10 minutes of eating it, and they think, ah, it just doesn't agree with me, but actually it could be a bona fide allergy. Absolutely, and in fact, a lot of fruits are in the same family as tree nuts. So for instance, a peach, if you think about the little pit, it looks exactly like an almond. Mm -hmm. That's because it's in the almond family. Right. So you've had a lot of experience, uh, let's say, your, your experience has been pretty dramatic, and in fact, you are his inspiration to be involved with, uh, with FAN. That's correct, yeah. And the, the way that you were treated specifically early on, did you have wheezing episodes? Did you have anything uh, beyond the, the usual? Well, I had asthma growing up, okay. but it was mostly the first episode. We were trying to find information about food allergies, and at that point, it w information was not that prevalent. And my dad reached out and found FAN, which was a young organization started by Ann Munoz for a long years ago. And um, it's grown enormously because all of us in the allergy community realized that we need to get the information out there, not just for ourselves, but for those new families with food allergies, for those families who will develop it, who maybe if they've heard, seen a program like this or if they've heard about allergies from somewhere offhand, it may save lives. In fact, it does save lives. Right. So he was, uh, obviously, you, you became very much involved with this, but he was, uh, he was identified as being allergic to certain foods. Any environmental allergens that you ended up having to do allergy shots or any of those uh, kinds of things for him? Total avoidance. That's the easiest way to do it. Okay. And, then, and I think Dr. White explained it. It's easier in the house. You can pretty much keep your house in pretty good shape. But grandparents' house is tougher. Yeah. I would imagine. Schools we talked about, okay. and restaurants because you don't always know what the ingredients are. And so what FAN tries to do is give people advice so that they can lead about as normal a life as you can. And we do have somebody who's been very kind to, to at least to a lot of allergic uh, patients. Sure, it's never a problem. You I mean, most people come into the restaurant, it's usually for milk eggs, dairy, and for us we just learned over experience that we can easily do it by sanitizing the area when we're making pizzas because that's usually what we make. Have a sanitized area for them, put them through, it's never a problem, and if you're a restaurant manager, an entrepreneur, know what's in your food. Right. Check and see. I mean when people come in for eggs, don't do dressings. Oil and vinegar always works well. Get extra vol uh, excuse me, <clears throat> olive oil, vinegar, it's never a problem for them. We'll yeah, I guess they do. It's, it's not great when they're trying to breathe and eat. No, my sister's <laughs> a diabetic, so trust me, I know what happens okay, all right. real fast. Well, it's great that you have a restaurant where you're sensitive to those issues, and uh, we thank you for being here. No and, problem. And bringing us the snacks that you make at Easily your restaurant. Done. Out in Chantilly, that's great, that's great. Um, so we're hearing, of course, uh, that the, the diagnosis is going to be something that you can do your typical allergy testing for, and of course some people would then say, well, how long do you stay allergic, or is there any way to track it over time? Um, yes. Actually, with good avoidance, a lot of children will outgrow their food allergies over a period of two years or, or longer. Um, and so what I do is once we've made the diagnosis, then we follow it yearly with the blood test. And if the blood test gets down below a certain level, and that varies for every food, um, then we have them come into the office and we do a food challenge before we allow them to eat the food at home. And the purpose of that is to slowly feed them the food over the course of about two hours or so and then observe for another hour to be sure, or two hours, to be sure that it's going to be safe. All right. So that's a pretty hazardous sort of thing that some people may be inclined to want to do on their own or sitting in their car next to the ER or mm -hmm. something. You wouldn't advise that? Uh, no. Not at <laughs> no, all? No, I wouldn't. Okay. Um, you know, occasionally somebody actually reacts during one of those things, and occasionally we have to pull out our adrenaline and, you know, give them a shot. So, no, I wouldn't okay. do it. So that's a, it's a big deal. 
Um, relative to eczema, which we were talking about a little bit, and we've heard some of these kids when they were really little had, had bad skin. Uh, eczema, as you were saying, is one of those diseases that seems to be an affliction of the skin that makes it dry and it starts to itch. And as they scratch, as they say traditionally, it's the, the uh, itch that rashes. Uh, it's uh, something that's fairly subtle. You can feel roughness on the skin, but as the kids become more sensitized to uh, the little bacteria that cause the irritation, they start to scratch, and then uh, all heck breaks loose. Um, how often will you find that there are food allergies in association with eczema? It's actually fairly common, and I would say about 50% of the eczema patients that I see have a food allergy. So the incidence of food allergy is higher in eczema, but that's not the whole story. Um, and even if you have a food allergy, um, the, the skin in eczema is abnormal. So you can eliminate the food. The eczema gets better, but it's not totally gone. And that's, um, that's very frustrating for many people. <coughs> but eczema skin, if you dry it out, if it gets itchy, if you start rubbing, or scratching, it'll break out, and it doesn't matter whether the skin got itchy because you ate a food that you shouldn't have eaten, or, or somebody is holding the baby and, and doing this and rubbing the back constantly. Right. Okay, um, so, and of course we all know that certain uh, climates, if it's cold and dry, and you're prone to eczema, you might have a flare. In the wintertime, people seem to have right. worse times with it, so we know that it's not all food related. No, and in fact, there's some data to suggest that um, sun exposure and vitamin D actually improves eczema. So if you look at the equator, there's very little eczema down there. Okay, and sun exposure, of course, being what the sun, the solar radiation is what converts the precursor to vitamin D to vitamin D. Mm -hmm. And of course, why everybody thinks we have vitamin D deficiency is because we're inside and we're covered with sunscreen and we don't want to get sunburned because we don't want to get sun cancer or skin cancer, which is of course <laughs> a wise thing to avoid. But so vitamin D levels are often uh, something that uh, you might even check in, in people who have allergies because they may improve subtly if you supplement. Do you routinely do that? Um, I make sure people are getting their calcium and D if they're, um, if they're milk allergic. Okay. Um, and only if the eczema is terrible do I check the vitamin D, but I'm finding that the pediatricians more and more are starting to look at that. Okay. Um, so and there's some, some, some studies that are starting to be done. Interesting concept. So when we're talking about treatment, as we've heard from the audience here, uh, it's avoidance. It's avoidance. It's preparation. Absolutely. Education. <laughs> uh, we've even heard uh, one who uh, actually learned to read before anybody else because his parents were stressing labels. Um, but are there other things that you can do to treat uh, food allergies? Well, there's some, aside from avoidance, there is some work that's being done on desensitization. Um, and the jury is still out on um, slowly desensitizing people as to whether that's in the long run a good thing or whether it might introduce some additional problems. But um, the work right now is being done on desensitization for uh, peanut allergy. It's not something that I would ever recommend that somebody do totally on their own because it can be really dangerous. Mm -hmm. Um, usually you start that off in the doctor's office, you get up to a certain level of eating the food and you continue that for a requisite amount of time at home before you then increase. And it's still experimental. So I know the, with air airborne allergies, the seasonal mm -hmm. allergies, uh, you make a serum of that allergen and it creates some kind of an immune response that then blocks or helps to mute your sensitivity when you actually have that allergy season. So you're saying that there may be some hope that they can figure out some way to do that with the food. Exactly, but doing it by the oral route. Right. There's also some research that's being done on Zolaire, which is um, a medication given by injection that's available for severe asthma. Um, it blocks IgE, which is the allergy molecule. And so it's being looked at as well for treatment of food allergies. Yeah, and we'll talk to someone here who actually uh, had the experience of, of using Zolaire. It, it, give us a little perspective. I guess you're the one who probably enrolled him in the first place. Mm -hmm. That started at, the... at what age and he was having what kinds of symptoms that you were trying <clears throat> to correct or trying to treat? He was having frequent reactions. Um, 
uh, and he's asthmatic, so the shot was actually meant for the asthma, okay. but with a beautiful side effect. It is definitely the miracle drug. Yeah, um, I'm actually four years without an EpiPen or inhaler. Um, I can eat everything that I was allergic to, and um, I'm fine. I actually had salmon for lunch, and <laughs> no reaction. Wow, that's fantastic. So we have the potential for something that could be really life-altering relative to the medication, and, and that's still in a testing phase with the FDA. For food allergies, right, yes. Right, for food allergies. So something on the horizon, something to look forward to. Um, I know you work with Dr. White. That is correct. And what do you do there? I'm one of her assistants. I work in the clinic and I do um, skin testing. I'm responsible for blood draws as well for the children. Um, and so you, you, you had some skin testing. I actually do. These are called our duo tip devices, mm -hmm. which is a plastic little device that we just basically, a simple scratch on the skin with the actual food that we're testing to. And then we wait for about 15, 20 minutes and see if there's a reaction to the food. So much like we were talking about before, we have these histamine reactions. That is they, correct. They just swell up into like a mosquito a mosquito bite. bite and lots of redness around it. That is correct. Right. Which and we then call. you mm -hmm. measure it, and it's all relative to how big you it is. Based on the size, that's yeah. correct. Oh, mm -hmm. interesting. And then, of course, you also have that life-saving device. That is correct. Yes. Which is called an EpiPen. All right. So, and <laughs> it's. I guess the first thing that ends up happening in that office is that. Every time that you, you have a real bona fide diagnosis, do you prescribe an EpiPen? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. And, and actually, um, the EpiPen needs to be wherever the person with the allergy is. So for children, and I get a lot of kickback from insurance companies on this, but I'm a very strong believer for, that for children, there needs to be EpiPens at school, needs to be at home, in the backpack, babysitter if they go someplace for after school care. Um, but yes, everybody who has the potential for anaphylaxis gets an EpiPen. And so it, it may happen that someone's in a situation where they are with someone who does have a, a food reaction, and they may have an EpiPen, but they may not even be strong enough or capable of using it. That is correct. So why don't you demonstrate it All to right. us so that we know <laughs> what we have to do if we see somebody in that situation. Okay, so this is actually a trainer, so there's no actual epinephrine in here. Or it's a single dose of adrenaline, and this is, would be your safety cap. You always want to hold it as a fist, because here would be the needle where the needle pops out. Right. So the safety cap, once the safety cap is off, it is ready to go. So any touch of the bottom of the needle will administer the adrenaline. And what you want to do is you want to take this portion, if it's a child, you want to be sure that the child is on your lap and that you have, um, as a parent, you would have them in between your lap and your leg over across of them so that they're unable to move. And when you would take this portion of their leg, administer it, it's designed to go through jeans, through any kind of type of clothing, and you would hold for a 10 second count so that all the medication is administered into the muscular area there. And that is in any situation relative to your known exposure or any symptom evolving? That is correct, yes. So that mm -hmm. uh, you gotta be prepared. You gotta be prepared at all times. <laughs> what happens when you get a dose of epinephrine? <laughs> well, it's a shot of adrenaline. So right. if you think of how you feel in the middle of a scary movie when the bad guy jumps out <laughs> with his mask on, your heart, go heart rate goes up, um, that's an adrenaline rush. Okay, and, and that's what you feel how like long will this. it last? Um, Probably about 20 minutes, but we have a few people in the room that have actually experienced it. Mm -hmm. um, about and, minutes. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh huh. So that crab was was really bad. Huh? <laughs> oh, it was a horseradish <laughs> that did it for you. Restaurant not as nice as this person's restaurant, and uh, it seems that there's a horseradish mayonnaise that a lot of delis like to use, and they don't tell you. And I took a bite of a horseradish of a roast beef sandwich that had a horseradish mayonnaise, and off I went. Yes. As I say, did you do it? Did you administer it to yourself? No. See, nope. I was a really bad patient. I was out of town, and I only had one EpiPen, and I thought, well, maybe I can make it. Yeah, yeah, that could have do. that could have been the last yeah, it was. decision so it you was made. Really I'm bad. glad it, it was wasn't. Really yes, bad. that's right. So you, it's hard to leave it up to the patient. Yes, it is. So, know. but it's but it's really bad. And we have someone who works with the health department. You've you've got your own EpiPen demo for us here too. 
But you're with Fairfax County? Yep, I'm a school health, public health nurse. And you are part of the health department, but you provide the schools with their, their training and their clinic aids. We are. Uh, my, yeah, my job is putting a safe plan in place for our students, all of our students with health conditions, but particularly our kids with severe allergies. And so you're the one who has to determine how people respond when they have those potential exposures and you're not quite sure exactly what's going on. So how many kids in our public schools here in Fairfax would have uh, EpiPen orders? Last year's school year, 2009-2010, we had about 2,400 okay. orders for epinephrine okay. in the school. And of course, there are untold numbers for other kinds of allergic issues, Benadryl or albuterol, the inhalers mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Um, have, how many times did people have to use their EpiPens in the schools? About 51 times last year. Okay, and that's mm -hmm. with about 160,000 students. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know how many Somewhere students. close to that, I know yeah, that. But yes. we worked it out, it's that's about 2% good. of the, the or, total number of epinephrine orders. Okay, and none Before. of them had catastrophic outcomes? No. That's because you prepared the classroom? We work really hard to, with the, the parents, the educators, um, the school staff, to, to make this kid a, a, a safe learning environment for the students. So we collaborate, collaborate really closely with parents and their doctors and the school staff. So I go in and I'll, I'll train staff on how to give epinephrine. Um, they, it's like a three-step training process or procedure. They'll, they'll do a, an anaphylaxis um, allergy curriculum and then they'll, um, they'll do that on their own, and then they'll come to us for hands-on um, EpiPen or epinephrine training, depending on what the administration system is. So you've been able to work that out pretty well? Yeah. Okay. And the last part is that teachers need to be familiar with the, the individualized care plans that right. we put in place for each student with severe allergies. Well, it's good to know that we have a school system that's sensitive to it, and I know that they need that work and they need you to help them. I, I want to thank you all for contributing all your information and your experiences. You've done a great job and we really appreciate it. I think everybody's learned a lot and thank you Dr. White for being here with us. And I hope you've been able to, to grasp some of the, the nuances, some of the issues with food allergies. And of course, if you have issues, you have questions, you, you know where to find us. In the meantime, until the next show, I'm Dr. Russell Libby looking out for your health. <laughs>